Hi, everybody, and welcome. I see that folks are still signing on, but we do have a full agenda today. So why don't we get started? Uh, welcome to Diplomats at Work. This is a new AFSA series designed to introduce audiences to the important and very varied, varied work of the Foreign Service. This uh, series is a partnership between AFSA and the Una Chapman Cox Foundation. And um, I wanted to say a few words about AFSA if you're not familiar with us. AFSA is the professional association for the US Foreign Service. And we have about 16,000 members from across the US government. Uh, in addition to the State Department, which many of you are familiar with, did you know that there are Foreign Service officers across five other government agencies? That would be at the US Agency for International Development, at the Foreign Agricultural Service, Foreign Commercial Service, the US Agency for Global Media, and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. I hope I didn't forget anybody. And uh, the, one of the key tasks of AFSA is really to help tell the story of our foreign service far and wide. So my name is Nadja Ruzika, and I am going to be your host today. Today we have, for our first event, we have a really exciting story and a great guest, um, Supervisory Special Agent Kayla Bokelman from the Diplomatic Security Service at the State Department. Before we get into the content, the exciting content, which everyone is here for, I do want to draw your attention to just a few housekeeping rules. One, um, the structure of today's event is that we're going to be talking with Kayla for about 35 minutes, and then we're going to open it to audience Q&A for about 15-ish minutes. And so please, I urge you, given how many the, uh, of us there are today, to type your questions into the chat box and type them in early. You can do it at any point throughout the discussion. <clears throat> and then when the time comes for the Q&A, I will then read those questions out to Kayla. Second, please do keep your uh, mics and video off for today. Uh, there are, again, there are a lot of us on. We want to keep it looking clean. Uh, and thirdly, the event is going to be recorded. I saw a few questions come in on that already. The event will be recorded. We will put it on the AFSA website, but we will also send it to all folks who registered with some additional information. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Kayla. Um, Kayla, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us today. Um, we are really, really excited at this opportunity to hear from you about your work at the Diplomatic Security Service and especially about this case that you've talked to us about um, when you were posted in Costa Rica. And so why don't we just get started by having you talk to us about um, DSS, the Diplomatic Security Service. I think I would say most of us are familiar with the State Department carrying out US foreign policy and international relations. But um, I have to admit that for a long time, I did not know that such a bureau as the Diplomatic Security Service actually existed within the State Department. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about DSS as it's known and what its role is in uh, the Department of State, but also in our government. All right, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as you said, not everybody knows about Diplomatic Security Service, so I always welcome the opportunity to highlight uh, all the great efforts uh, we do uh, domestically and uh, around the world. And also, I want to thank AFSA for everything. I've been a lifelong member since uh, I joined the department, and I know about all the great things you do, uh, both internally for us as employees, but also uh, externally. So I really do appreciate that. All right, so why don't we talk about Diplomatic Security Service for a little bit? Um, it is, you know, even so basically what diplomatic security services is, is we are that bureau within the U.S. Department of State that is the law enforcement and security arm of the U.S. Department of State and permits our foreign policy and our diplomats and our personnel around the world that that safe and secure platform to go out and do their jobs. Right. So without that, we wouldn't be able to operate in a lot in many different countries. Right. Because we have to ensure that our people, our facilities and our personnel are safe and secure. And that is one of our key components of our job. We are located at every embassy and consulate, um, almost every consulate around the world. 
um, you will have an agent there. Um, and that is one, like I said, one of our primary goals is to ensure the, the safety uh, of those uh, missions. The other thing that we do in the department is we do investigations. Uh, we investigate passport and visa fraud. Uh, we're looking at counterterrorism. We're looking at anything that might be a threat to the, the embassy or our personnel that are trying to operate. We also do protection. We protect the Secretary of State and all foreign dignitaries. This is domestically now, all foreign dignitaries that come to the US, uh, including also ceremonial heads of state. So when I say that, what do I mean? I mean, think of the royal family that comes over or probably my favorite and probably most DSS agents uh, favorite is the Dalai Lama. You know, there's something special about that guy. I'm not going to lie. Um, and then we also, another uh, protective detail that we do, and a lot of people don't realize we're doing that, is we're protecting our athletes when they go uh, internationally and compete. So obviously a big one coming up, you know, fingers crossed, is the Olympics in Japan. Um, and then also last year, I always like to give the shout out to the Women's World Cup. We were there, go team U.S. Uh, National Women's Soccer Team, uh, we, were, we were there as well with them. So it's it's a great job. And I mean, I could talk about a thousand other different crazy protective details we've done. And, and so that's really uh, a fun part of the job as well. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't come in and say, look, you know, not only are we uh, sworn federal law enforcement officers and agents, we are also diplomats. And so a big part of our job is to liaison with our counterparts around the world. So again, in every country we are, but also again, back in the United States. And we have a whole operation domestically as well. We have 33 field op, uh, uh, offices we operate out of. Um, every agent, when they first come on, goes out to a field office uh, to learn passport and, investigate, uh, passport and visa fraud investigations. This is where you kind of cut your teeth. I mean, I, I went to San Francisco. Um, while we're out there, we sit on a lot of different types of task forces, whether it's the human trafficking task forces or documents and benefit, benefit fraud task forces. We're out there uh, liaison, liaisoning with our uh, American counterparts, both at the federal, state and local levels. Um, finally, it's not just agents. I, I know I'm an agent and I'm talking about it, so I'm going to bring that perspective, of course. But we also have security engineer officers, uh, security technicians that provide us that that. Uh, that IT and cyber uh, security platform that, again, can't operate without anywhere, can't do secure communications. And then finally, we have our diplomatic couriers. And that creates the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, along with our civil servants, our locally engaged staff overseas, and our contractors. Wow. Thank you for that really uh, great and very succinct overview. I mean, it sounds like a very complex and big operation. You were able to describe it to us pretty quickly. Thank you for that. I think uh, depending, you know, I understand our audience um, really comes from across the spectrum. There are some folks who are interested in the Foreign Service, some who are interested in the topic, but I bet you most folks are probably uh, surprised to find out about some of the things that GSS works on. So that's great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned one of the key tasks uh, of DSS is investigations. And I know that over the course of your, I think, 16 year career, you've done all kinds of different investigations. Um, but the one that seems to have stayed with you the most is this case in Costa Rica, Operation Rhino, um, where you busted a child pornography trafficking ring. And so why don't you um, tell us about it? And actually, if you could start please with how on earth does the U.S. Embassy and Caleb Oakleman even get involved in a Costa Rican pornography ring, child pornography ring? Busting up a child pornography Busting ring. Busting up, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, well, you, you, this is something I, you know, I think this case really just highlights, I, I took it, I was able to take it, this case and highlight all the great work, uh, not just myself and my, my great Costa Rican counterparts were doing, but really the embassy as a whole. And when you, you extrapolate it out further, DSS as a whole, right? Um, so, you know, I, this case didn't just, my, my, my favorite prosecutor in Costa Rica, Angie, really in the world, Angie Trejos, didn't just call me one day. You know, she she we had worked together on multiple human trafficking and smuggling cases before this this case uh, came came forward. And so we, we both knew how we worked. We both got along professionally and personally. We knew we could trust each other. She knew she could trust me to do whatever it takes to solve a case. I knew that that's that's how she operates. 
And so that's how we became first involved. Like they, they hit, they, they knew about this uh, case in 2015. They brought me in in 2016 because at that point they realized that the case was not just contained to Costa Rica, right? They were, what was happening with this is you, you had this network that was producing the material in Costa Rica, but it was being distributed out of Mexico to a worldwide audience. And at that point they knew they needed some help hitting and get, reaching out to those, those different countries. And who better to do that than someone from DSS, right? We are, just like I said in my opening, we are at every embassy uh, around the world with m multiple consulates, we're, we're everywhere. So it's real easy for me to reach out to my colleagues and, and find out information that just might not be available to anybody else. So when the time came, they were like, the only person we wanna work with is Kayla. And so they called me, I went down to talk to them. And quite honestly, I said, look, I'm not the expert here, right? I, I, uh, I've, I've interviewed and talked to over a hundred uh, trafficking victims, but those were all adults in different circumstances. Um, this was different, right? And I, I, all I care about um, is, is is solving the, the case. So I was like, look, I can reach out to somebody else um, and, and get some more expertise. And they're like, no, no, we want you. And that, you know, that really means a lot. It means a lot to me. It means a lot that they know that DSS as an organization is always there to help because it, it didn't just come, come with me. It came with my predecessor. It came with other people in the embassy. And also when you're talking about, you know, child exploitation, you know, you're talking about kids and keeping kids safe, no matter where it is, keeps kids safe everywhere. So this case did, you know, with international buyers, we knew some were coming out of uh, the United States. So we knew money was traveling in through the US and that's how we became involved and why it also matters, not just to us personally um, and the Costa Ricans and the US embassy, but also to America, right? They're using our systems to, uh, you know, further this crime. Yeah, absolutely. So pull the curtain back a little bit. Um, you get this call from from the Costa Rican authorities and what what's happening what's happening inside the embassy what's happening with your team you know and and I, I always like to say and I, and I just they're not just throwaway words I always like to say diplomacy solved this case right because again I had already worked human trafficking cases with with my colleagues and the prosecutors but in fact the embassy as a whole had made combating human trafficking and combating child exploitation a priority so we had different elements within the embassy working on different aspects of human trafficking, right? Sure, I'm working a case, but the political section was working with their Costa Rican colleagues to you know, work on changing some wording in the laws and in the human trafficking laws of Costa Rica. So it was more in line with international standards, which then benefits Costa Rica because they get more recognition for the hard work and the cases they were doing. Um, the political, or I'm sorry, the public affairs section developed a special international visitor leadership program training for my colleagues uh, to come up to the United States for a 30 days of training and the exchange of ideas all around the country. I mean, that's, it's such a great program. Um, and I highly encourage everybody to look at it. I mean, we, we bring people in all the time. It, it benefits us, it benefits um, the, the, the people we bring in and the countries they're from. Um, yeah. And then finally, um, yeah. well, yeah. we had, talking. I hope we'll put the mic on, or move the mic. Um, and so, you know, this, this whole, and then finally, of course, our INL, uh, International Car Narcotics and Law Enforcement, division, I was collaborating with them on doing human tra trafficking training, right? Well, you know, we have to, it's not just like I said, working cases, there's a whole element uh, to trying to combat this, these crimes. Yeah. It does sound like a very uh, multi-layered and very complex approach. It's not, it doesn't sound just like a simple investigation as sort of I envision these things. So then let's not keep everybody in suspense. So you got the guys in the end. Um, what is it? What happened? How did it all go down? Okay, so I'm just going to kind of walk you through the case, you know, maybe give you that, that maybe a bird's eye view that, that, that you don't normally get in cases like this, especially now. Uh, we did get the we did get the network. Uh, we took the network down in Costa Rica and Mexico. And in fact, uh, the two main perpetrators out of Costa Rica have been not only uh, arrested, but they have been convicted and sentenced. 
And uh, yeah, I'm going to hold that spoiler for just a second. Uh, so, uh, you know, so again, that call comes, I go meet with uh, Angie and Walter and Mauricio about this. Um, what, what's, what are the elements? Where are they at? How can I help? Um, and so we sit down and we, we divide up what needs to be done, right? Angie's taking the lead because she's just amazing. They're all amazing. Um, but uh, we divide up what we're all going to do. Clearly, obviously, my role is, is, is that, that international push. But also, you know, to finally, you know, we, we, can, we can get into the websites. We can see evidence. We can figure out some of the victims. And at, at that point, we had already identified 27 for sure. Uh, children, some as young as nine that had been victimized. Um, but we now needed to, to try to ensure that we could, you know, link our, our suspects to a monetary gain and, and the money. So that required me to reach back to our undercover operation unit in, uh, in the States and say, hey, look, I need a Bitcoin account and I need some generic uh, credit cards, right, so that I can try to get in. And um, to their credit, they, they had this stuff turned around like that, right? I mean two days, I, I, we're up and running on, on that when we're ready to go. Then finally, I, you know, I, I want to just talk about it a little bit just because, you know, I remember, you know, when we finally got to the point, we we're going to enter that site and, and try to link that money to them. Um, it was a judge, it was like three prosecutors, uh, the federal, uh, the Costa Rican federal agents that were working the case and myself, and we're all crammed in this small, tiny little room. <laughs> And we're we're trying to get everything done, and we finally were able to do what we needed to do, and we definitively linked our suspects uh, to the money. So at that point, now we're starting to get ready to, uh, you know, take down this network. But also, there was a part of it at, as well during this time. I'm now knowing that it's being, you know, we all know it's being, uh, uh, you know, sent out in Mexico. So I just immediately call up my my colleague, who is also what we call an ARSOI, an Assistant Regional Security Officer Investigator. There's a mouthful, right? What, it's what, under the Overseas okay. Criminal Investigation Program within DSS. Okay. I call her up and I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. Can you help me? And she, of course, just like every DSS agent I've come across in my almost 17 year career now, says, absolutely, what do you need? So we talk about it. She says, I'll get, to, I'll get back to you by the end of the day. And sure enough, by the end of the day, that she's reached out to a prosecutor. She's reached out to some other agencies. We have the people we need to talk to to try to coordinate a takedown in the two countries. So at that point also, I'm able just to hand this information over to Angie, who now can just run with it, right? She doesn't have to spend weeks looking for the right person in, in Mexico. We have that person within a day. Um, so they start coordinating. We all start working together to, to, to coordinate our efforts to bring down the entire network. Great. Finally, June 8th of 2017 shows up and this is our date. We're going to take them down. Right. So we all line up at 530 in the morning down this this narrow little road in, in the residence section uh, in this area. And it, oddly enough, I had, didn't even think about it till, up to about right now, which is he was kind of at a dead end street. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of fitting. Ooh. So we're all lined up. It's 530 in the morning. The sun's kind of starting to come up. It's kind of misty, you know, and we're all just trying to get ready to go for what's going to be a very long day of search warrants and arrest warrants. And I'm standing there with Angie and she finally looks at me at about 530 and she says, oh yeah, by the way, I just talked to the prosecutor in Mexico. Uh, the judge hasn't signed off on all of their arrests and search warrants. <laughs> and so now it's like, you know, we want to take down the network, but we're kind of stuck. We got to go no matter what. And so we're, you know, calls are being made. We're kind of, you know, like, oh, this is a little, a little crazy. Yeah. Finally, we get to go ahead and in we go. They, they, they call us and they're like, we're good to go. Um, six o'clock hits. That's when we can, could, could execute our warrants and uh, our, our search warrants and our arrest warrants. So we, uh, Angie and I go into one of the main perpetrators. His name was Solano. We go in. He's arrested. He's now sat on a chair. And then the whole team comes in and we conduct a, an entire... Uh, we conduct a search warrant of his entire dirty little house. I'll just call it what it is because that's how I remember it. Um, and we look everywhere. We're tearing up floorboards. We're uh, going through every desk, turning everything over. And we are coming across evidence uh, that we've seen. And, you know, I, I opened up one of the closets and in there was some of the clothing that the children have been forced to wear. 
which was was really like you know it's that you know that's what you do in a search warrant you find evidence but nothing quite prepares you for that that kind of kick in the gut right and it still kind of breaks my heart to think about it um you know knowing knowing what happened so but we we, we do that and we're we're you know we're, we're uh cataloging it at all and then angie and i are finally going through some boxes and uh you know talking going through boxes looking at everything and we pull out this stack of papers like that you know i can't really see it there we go yeah. stack of papers like that and on it are, are over a hundred other kids names oh my that God. they had gathered right and these are kids that they were looking to potentially exploit and and this was a group that they would go into these these economically depressed areas of the country and um you know dangle you know set up what what looked like you know modeling opportunities international modeling opportunities right so not only are they taking advantage and exploiting families and kids that that you know uh, are are somewhat desperate they're now not only like dangling this hope and dream that's never going to happen right i mean it's just it's it's horrible so you know we so we find that and and, and he kind of realized at that point like yeah, that's why you do this, right? It's it's obviously to get the, the bad people, it's to, it's to arrest them, it's get to get that sentence and conviction, but it's also to ensure you help the victims that you know about and potentially stop anybody else from having to go through that, that horrific uh, experience. So finally, after 12 hours, we have everything, we load them up, uh, we take them to the courthouse where the two main uh, perpetrators were remanded to custody for the duration of the trial. Uh, that made everybody feel very good um about two you know about a year to two years later you know justice grinds kind of slowly everywhere um the the two main perpetrators were actually convicted um to uh each each received 757 years uh convictions um which shows the seriousness of the crime but also the seriousness of uh how, how serious costa rica took it and also just the, the, the amazing case that Angie and all of her colleagues were able to put together um, to, to truly just wipe out this particular network. Wow, that's fascinating. So what happened to the victims? The victims, you know, they, they very much, that was very much kept confidential, but we, uh, we were able to get them uh, the social services uh, assistance that they needed uh, between uh, Costa Rica's uh, uh, social the Ministry of Social Services, and then also NGOs in the country. So they continue to get whatever they need as far as assistance, because that's a that's important, right? I mean, you can't do these cases without uh, some type of victim assistance. Absolutely. And so it sounds when you were um, describing, you know, being on the ground with the Costa Rican authorities, it sounds like it was a true sort of partnership um, with with this host country. Is that typical, sort of this level of an involvement in these kinds of cases? It, it really is. You know, I, I, I regularly talk to my uh, my colleagues in DSS and my fellow agents and, and you know, just, just uh, being on the ground, uh, working with our colleagues and our counterparts um, to, 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 to develop those relationships, it really does become a true partnership. Um, because you spend days and weeks and months together, really, on some of these complex investigations, and you you, you really get to know each other very well. Um, and so it is actually it is actually fairly common around the world. The other thing is is we also have our locally engaged staff that are at the embassies, and these are these are. Uh, these are the people in the country. They're they're whatever whichever country we're we're in. That's you know they come and work for us. So if it's Germany, they're German. If they're Costa Rican, it's Costa Rican. And these these employees, they're working for the U.S. Embassy and and helping to advance our foreign policy and our our uh, you know what our priorities. And they're just truly amazing. And they don't they don't leave. Right? They're there all the time. And you know we've had people that. 20, 30 years in, in the embassy. And, you know, it, it, they're truly amazing. And they provide that continuity and they provide the, the continuing contact that really is necessary uh, to, to work cases, to, to do whatever we need to do, um, whether it's to advance our policy, our economic goals, um, help American citizens abroad. I mean, during the pandemic now, 
you know, we've, we've helped Americans get back. We didn't do that just by ourselves. We did that through our contacts, our locally engaged staff helped out. Um, that's, that's how we make this work. Yeah. It sounds like DSS is really kind of a unique, um, animal is not the right word. But <laughs> Some days. <laughs> where it really, the diplomacy part of it is very important. The continued presence in the country over the years where you build up these contacts and these relationships that you really can then go in in situations like this in Costa Rica and really be able to have a much stronger effect. And it seems like DS, the, the nature of DSS, and maybe you can talk to us a little bit more about that. You've mentioned you're in a lot of countries around the world, but it seems like the nature of DSS is really well equipped to handle this type of crime, where it's transnational, where it can leak across other countries, but also importantly, um, something that can end up in our own country as well. Right, and that's that's just it, because we are everywhere, um, and that's our mandate, right? That That is what we are. We are diplomats and we are federal agents. We're both. And we recruit, we hire, and we train our people to be those things, right? Um, because it's not enough just to be an, an agent and go work cases. You have to be able to liaison and, and work well with people. Um, you have to put the diplomat in diplomatic security, right? Um, and so because we're everywhere, and again, we have that presence not just overseas, but domestically, um, we're able to reach out both ways, right? So if we, de if we develop the case overseas and we see links to the United States, we just reach out to the United States, we just reach out to our colleagues in whatever field office and vice versa. If we're in the field office and we see links to uh, a country, we just pick up the phone and call somebody, right? And, and that occurs even now during the pandemic. Um, we're there, even though it's, it's minimal staff, at all embassies and consulates around the world, we're still there. So if I need to, if I need something out of Mongolia, I'm just going to call the RSO in Mongolia and be like, hey, can you help me out? And he's going to say yes. Um, and so when you have these types of transnational uh, organizations committing international crimes, to have us situated anywhere means we can follow up anywhere. And not only that, we know the person we can more easily find the, the, the local people to as well help us, right? Because it's not just all about us. If, if someone is, is perpetrating a crime, either originating in that country or using that country, we only make the United States safer, but our partner nation safer when we all collaborate together. And that's really the name of the game yeah. in these types of cases. Yeah, that's, that's um, I think, mm -hmm. a, a very unique dimension to to DSS. So um, in the end, how, you know, you've said Operation Rhino has sort of stayed with you the longest. And do you have any follow-ups from your time there? Or are you still connected with Maria and the, and the team? With Angie? Yeah, excuse me. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> you can't help but, but still stay in contact. Um, I do occasionally hear from her. I also, uh, Occasionally hear from my really good friend who was in uh, Costa Rica's uh, Interpol. And as a matter of fact, I, I was on one of the main uh, suspects in, in the case. He was on the other main suspect. So we were actually calling each other during the, during the search warrants to talk about what we were finding and to share pictures with each other. So, um, and even now we, we still, um, we still uh, are, are in contact and when they come up, uh, to the states, a couple of them been to the states. I obviously we get together, and then of course I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, you know my wonderful colleagues at you know Costa Rican colleagues at the embassy itself. Um, still regularly in contact with them. I mean, just ultimate you know uh, professionals and wonderful people. So that that's the other great thing about this job um, is you know I'm still in contact with people not just from Costa Rica but from my time in Baghdad and also my time in uh, Maputo, Mozambique. Um, and so you, you make these lifelong friends uh, wherever you go. And then of course, San Francisco and then uh, headquarters positions as well. Um, I, and that's what I really truly enjoy uh, about DSS and the Department of State is just the, the, the number of amazing people that I've worked with, uh, top of their game, 
um, is, is, is remarkable. And I, I just feel so fortunate to have this job. Um, and, and now I get to come and talk about it. I mean, you know, life is good. Life is good. So why <laughs> don't you tell us, before we go into the audience q and I'm sure everyone is thinking the same thing. How did you get into the diplomatic security service? Like, what was, what was your career path? So, you know, um, that'd probably be best with the long and winding road. Um, <laughs> so, you know, first of all, I'm originally from Nebraska. So I got, of course, shout out to all my friends and family still in Nebraska, from Nebraska, um, of course. Um, but, you know, after I, after I graduated from the University of Nebraska, I actually uh, joined the Peace Corps and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia. And uh, I, I actually uh, lived and worked in Zambia for almost six years. Uh, after that, I came back to the United States. I got my MBA in finance um, and went to work at a... Uh, a bank as a senior financial analyst. After a little while, um, you know, I, I kind of decided, uh, you know, being a senior financial analyst, in addition to being kind of a conversation killer, um, is not really what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to get back to living and working overseas, which is what I wanted to do growing up anyway. I knew what DSS was from my time in Zambia, and I thought, you know, that seems like a fun job. Why don't Why don't I give that a try? Um, so. Like any other job, that's great, yeah. <laughs> applied, um, I got in, um, and they they trained me, and that's you know that's the thing about DSS. We're not and the department as well. We're not we're not looking for one particular type of person, right? We don't want everybody that you know. We we want a good mix of people. We want people with military experience, with law pri prior law enforcement, but prior government service in another sector, and even the private sector, right? That's what we want. We want that good mix of backgrounds and diversity to, to make us stronger, right? Because as, I've, as you can see, we do so many different things within uh, DSS that no one person is ever, one type of person is ever gonna fit the mold. You're, you need that diverse background. And, uh, and so that's what, you know, so that's how I came to be. Now, the other thing that happens is, is DSS is not just a, a job. It's a career. It's a lifestyle. So, but, you know, by the time I joined, I have a family uh, and then another child came along. So now, you know, family's coming with with me everywhere. Right. So they not only am I moving every two to three years because that's what we have to do is uh, in, the, in the foreign service. My family's also moving every two to three years. So, you know, they come to DC, they come to San Francisco, they go to D.C., then Maputo. They, they stayed in Maputo while I went to Baghdad. They didn't come to Baghdad. Um, well, the, the kids might have liked the, the helicopter ride. Um, but then, of course, we end up in Costa Rica and then, uh, you know, now now back here. So, that, you know, um, you know, it's 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 an adventure for family and friends. Let's put it yeah. that way. It sounds like it. Um, one more question for me and then we'll go into the audience questions. I see there are a lot coming in. Um, uh -oh. But it sounds, you know, law enforcement tends to be, I guess, a, a male dominated field. So I, I don't know if DSS is different. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a woman in law enforcement? Sure. Um, <laughs> that's a loaded question, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, no, and, and you're right. I mean, law enforcement is uh, more of a male dominated field, um, you know, there is, you know, there is more of a push to get more women into it, not just in DSS, but uh, in other uh, local and state and other federal agencies. And, and we are working hard on that. I know other agencies as well, but I know DSS, this is important to us. It's not just lip service. Um, we, you know, it is a, a big push. So, um, you know, and with that, you know, I, I'd like to say it's all, it's been all perfect, right? But it hasn't been, right? I mean, I can tell you stories, of course, you know, I, there, there were comments made there, there, you know, some people, you know, some agents maybe didn't think that, you know, I could do that great of a job, especially early on. And then part of it was probably based on being a woman, but, um, you know, quite honestly, that hasn't really been the norm in DSS. Um, as a matter of fact, the, those few comments and, and situations, they're so far in the past and they were really so far and few between that, um, it has been overwhelmingly positive, uh, my experience in DSS. And I have found allies uh, both in men and women 
um, that have helped me to, to learn, to grow as an agent, as a person. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been really quite good. And I think, you know, the other part again, and I've, you've heard me say this already is, you know, we are, we're, we're trying to attract people that want to work in diverse, you know, situations, right? You're going to have to work cross-culturally because you're going to go live in another country. If you can't intermingle with just about anybody, you're probably not going to do well in this job. So we, we kind of just attract those people that are open and, and, more easily just work with a, a, a diverse set of people. So I think that has also helped uh, throughout my career. So, and you know, the other part I just want to throw out as well is I have been out my entire career, right? And it has never been an issue, not domestically, not with other agents, not with the, the local staff at the embassies. So, you know, that's been the other positive experience that I've had. They know I have two kids. And, you know, it's it's all been very good. Good. So. Well, I'm sure um, I could ask you questions forever. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Thanks for indulging my my questions about everything from your career to the case in Costa Rica. But let's turn to we're at the 35 minute mark now. So let's turn to the questions that we've gotten from the audience. Sure. Okay. I think our questions are going to range because I think our audience is very varied. Sure. Um, so I will start here. Um, this is uh, getting a little bit more to your question about how the getting a career in DSS. Is, sure. Does it require criminal justice training? And um, for young people who are interested in a career with DSS or the Foreign Service, what would you recommend? Um, what would that, and that's a really good question. Um, so. Basically, if you're, you know, if you're interested in this type of career, of course, you know, yes, we are law enforcement. So if you, you know, you go and study that, um, that's going to help you, right? It gives you a leg up. Um, but in reality, also, like I said, we want that good, diverse background, right? I, I didn't study criminology. I, I did finance. Um, I know how the money works, right? That kind of helps in a case. You know how the money works, right? Yeah, Bitcoin, yeah. Um, I even made money on Bitcoin. That, not, that's not helping the government to make money. Um, so, uh, but in reality, so, you know, I would say the other thing that matters is your experiences, right? Um, again, demonstrate that you can work cross-culturally because you're going to have to, you're going to spend at least half of your career, at least half your career overseas. So, you know, go out and get that experience. There's lots of ways. I'm not saying you have to join the Peace Corps, um, you know, and, and while I love my Peace Corps time, don't get me wrong, that's not for everybody. So, you know, go out and get those different experiences. Um, you know, the great thing, I, I'm just gonna throw it out here, is if you go to careers.state.gov, on there is a lot of information about how to join the Foreign Service and how to get into diplomatic security service. All right. There's a ton of information and that's a great place to start um, because we're going to, you know, in there, they tell you what we're looking for. So don't waste an opportunity and information and knowledge that's sitting right there for you. Get out there. The other thing I'm going to say is, look, my current assignment is the head of DSS recruitment um, for, for the Foreign Service. Right. So I'm dealing with DS agents, our security engineer officers, our, our security technical specialists and our couriers, you know, in there, go and see what are the qualifications and the requirements. Now go and match what you need to get that job. And finally, if you really need some help, reach out to my office, reach out to AFSA, they have my, my email, but also you can reach out to the office, which is dsrecu, R-E-C-U at state.gov. We set up different information sessions. It won't be me. Most likely I want to get, you know, I have, I have this awesome, amazing, diverse team that has done uh, things I haven't done. And so they're also a great resource. Thanks. I should say we are um, dropping the links and the email that Kayla mentioned into the chat box, but we'll also be sending it out to everyone who registered after. So you guys will have it in an email. And I forgot to mention an important uh, request on our part, which is we have a very brief survey um, for all those who are in attendance today to take, we'll drop it into the chat box. 
um, is just four questions about um, how you found us and about any thoughts you might have on future uh, topics. So please take just a few seconds and take that survey. Okay. Okay. Next no question. problem. I fully support everybody going and doing that that poll. Thank you. Okay. So next question. It's a little bit long, so I'm going to read it. Um, okay. Can you please elaborate on how common interagency work is in diplomatic service, uh, diplomatic security? For example, given the nature of the case, do you work with the FBI? Um, are you working with Department of State uh, Office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons? Are you working with other agencies? And then is this something that re represents a challenge or an opportunity to access more resources? That's a really great question, actually. Who wrote that? Do they need a D job in DSS? Um, so uh, I'm just kidding. No, um, absolutely, 100% all the time we are working interagency. In this particular case, um, in this particular case, it was more. Uh, it, it was more just. It was more uh, compact and, and you know not really uh, a whole lot of interagency. But again, as you saw or as I discussed. Um, you know, we still had to make uh, links out to the United States. And when we do that, you know, I, I'm not I'm not micromanaging the agents that I reach back out to. Right. They, they're going to take it to their um, they're going to take it to their 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 different task forces. And 100 percent. Again, as I said, my in my first assignment, um, I was I was assigned to the Bay Area Human Trafficking Task Force. And on there are local state uh, police departments, sheriff's departments. Uh, other federal agencies um, and um, different prosecutors, uh, assistant U.S. attorneys. So we are all working in collaboration together to combat human trafficking. And again, every field office that we have right now, with the hundred, you know, few hundred agents we have at the field offices, they all have different people assigned to different task forces. So it is a constant collaboration. Plus, um, overseas. Uh, you know, sometimes we are the only law enforcement presence at post. So, of course, we get calls from uh, the FBI, from DEA, ATF, DHS. Um, <clears throat> we are constantly uh, getting, you know, outreach. Hey, can you, you know, who would we contact here? Or can you reach out this way? Or, you know, we just need uh, a simple records check. Is there any way you could help us? And the answer is yes, that's what we do. Right. That's why we're there. That's part of our mandate. Um, you know, I someone from the postal inspector reached out and just said, I need a birth certificate. And I'm like, all right, let me let's go get it for you. Um, <clears throat> so then he reached out and said, hey, I got a fugitive I want you to return. And I was like, all right. And that kicked off a whole series of uh, fugitives that we returned in the call center scam. Uh, cases that that he would he would work up here and then uh, any links to Costa Rica, I would get the Americans uh, arrested and extradited. <laughs> so constant collaboration, and that is what DSS does. Whether again, it's with our partners overseas or with our folks back in the states. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned Interpol briefly. Um, mm -hmm. Could you please talk about DSS experience with Interpol as a coordinating mechanism for law enforcement? Sure. So, you know, basically it's a, you know, when we're talking about returning fugitives, we're talking about any, any connections like that. Um, we're, we're, whether, you know, a, as agents, we are always going to be in contact with Interpol because they're going to notify us of people coming in potentially. We're going to notify them if we know people coming in. Um, Maybe for those of us who might not be familiar with Interpol, could we do a, a quick... Um, you know, I'm not that well versed on everything Interpol. I do know that we have an agent who uh, used to be my boss in Mozambique. He's sitting in Lyon, uh, France, which is my dream job, just in case anybody cares from DSS. Um, they don't. Uh, but uh, no, in case anybody cares, that's my dream job. Um, and he's over there and he's working uh, different aspects. And, and Interpol covers a lot. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm very, I just know the surface on it. You know, they cover a lot of different um, cases and, and, and dealing with policy as well. I mean, it might be um, trafficking, it might be smuggling, it might be counterfeiting, it might be, you know, fugitives. 
and red notices. So that's really, you know, how we would, you know, how we get involved that way. In Costa Rica, it was a lot of red notices about uh, fugitives coming through. Um, and so, uh, and then also when you're talking about, uh, you, when, you ca when you're looking for fugitives and you're trying to get them extradited, it's a whole process. Um, and many times it will involve Interpol. And so uh, uh, getting the, you know, getting the people arrested in country and then getting them shipped back, so. Okay, we have another longish question specifically <laughs> about the, the particular trafficking ring. But before we get into it, I just want to mention this survey again. It takes just a few seconds for you guys to fill it out and it'll make it that much better for us um, to provide the information that, that you guys want. Okay, so the question is, did your team look at the role of banks in facilitating this particular trafficking ring um, if the traffickers use banks? And if banks were used, what is your recommendation for banking institutions that are interested in helping curb human trafficking? So it wasn't just one bank doing this, right? This was multiple banks, and this was a pretty sophisticated ring, hence the Bitcoin, right? Um, they were starting and, and generic credit cards. So it was a lot harder. Now, there's already processes put in place within banks um, that that we can get information out of them through, uh, you know, either uh, basically we can, you know, we, we, we request information um, and then, you know, through formal mechanisms. If it's gonna be used in another country, then that's where um, mutual legal assistant treaters come into place. Um, if it's in the, in, in the States, you know, that's where you're getting uh, your search warrants if you need to go that far. Um, and so there's ways to get information already. Um, you know, I, this is, I mean, this is, we don't really have the time for me to get into different policies <laughs> on banking. Um, but, you know, but let me tell you, if, if a certain bank is facilitating, um, nefarious activities, you know, we already have, you know, ways to put on sanctions on them, right? I mean, think about Russia and how many people in Russia have sanctions and different banks and different corporations. So, um, and again, that's something that, um, we may or may not be involved in. DOJ is obviously going to take the lead on that. Uh, Department of Justice. Sorry, I'm trying not to use acronyms. That's good, thank you. Uh, but that's a, that's a well-known one. Come on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that would be a much more nuanced and conversation to get into. But do know that, that, that we do get help from banks regularly. Okay. Next question. How much was your involvement or were you involved in the actual trial process? Do you often participate in these trials? And if so, in what capacity? So in this particular case, I did not need to be involved in the trial aspects. However, in other cases, 100% DSS agents will get involved in the trial process, uh, especially when there's links back uh, to, I mean, not just links, but like we we have now developed some, some uh, a, 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 a separate case in the U.S., or we need to explain how we came about this information, right? A court isn't just going to take, you know, oh, here's some information from the U.S. Embassy, right? We have to explain and sometimes prove where this information came from. And so we would have to go sit in the trial process. And then we have a whole process um, we have to do, we, we have to engage in ourselves to allow us to to participate in the trials. So when when you're talking cases and and overseas and even in the states, but uh, especially overseas, um, you know, very early on, you're you're constantly looking at what am I doing now to get them, but what am I going to do to uh, make sure that the conviction stays and stands. Mm -hmm. And so we take that time. And then also as diplomats, we have certain immunities. Um, that we have to uh, take into consideration when we do testify. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole process, yeah. but it's not too bad, really. Um, so speaking of evidence, uh, making sure that the conviction sticks, in this particular case, what evidence was found um, slash used to corroborate your case? You had mentioned uh, Bitcoin. Did you also look at transactions? So when I when I say Bitcoin, I guess I wasn't clear. I mean, it is the it was those transactions. We knew who owned the websites. We knew um, we could see the money eventually flow through and end up in bank accounts in uh, Mexico and Costa Rica. Um, and so you know, but it's 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 
there's the money aspect of it, but there's also, um, you know, the, the, like I said, the clothing we found, different uh, other items, um, you know, things like that. I don't want to get too far down in the weeds of a, of a case, um, but uh, just because sometimes you can, you can get into how we do investigations that potentially could tip off uh, other organizations and other people. Um, I would say, I, I do know that, you know, I did write an article on it for AFSA actually, um, but I do know uh, subsequently what we're gonna do is send out um, an email, which will have some other links uh, with more detailed case information that the Costa Ricans actually released. And that's a better source of information, especially as it was their case. Um, and also I would like to say it, it won the case of the year in 2017, so good on them. Um, but uh, you can read a lot more about it and then you can see some of the evidence that was actually found because they, they uh, put uh, the, the pictures in the articles. That's great. So related to that, um, the following question is, what is the DSS relationship with the press? Um, how does a story like this get out? Uh, with the press? Press, yep, with the media. So do you, you do briefings for the press or private meetings with journalists, or is it one of these, like, I can tell you, but I'd have to kill you situations? <laughs> well, as an agent, I don't say that. It sounds terrible when I say that. Um, but, uh, no, we, you know, the, the Department of State and actually uh, Diplomatic Security Service, we have our own press offices. So we and our own press personnel that will set up, um, you know, we'll set up briefings on different cases, um, multiple agents uh, all throughout uh, DSS have been trained to speak to the media and speak on the record um, because we do feel it's important to get these stories out. I mean, um, one, so that you know that, that you know, crimes are, are being solved um, you know what we're out there doing, and you know that this opportunity exists if this is something you'd like to do, right? If you don't even know about us, there's, then there's no way you might even want to come in and, and be a DSS agent. Um, so it is a coordinated effort, and sometimes we're uh, just giving um, uh, briefings, and sometimes we are sitting down for interviews in the press. We, we do multiple different things. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you said this um, in as many words, but I think it's important also for Americans to know what DSS is doing for, for our citizens. So that's, I think, a really important um, piece of, of the work that you're doing. Okay, a few last questions about um, your career. So, oh, there are a lot more questions, but let's I'll, I'll try to squeeze in as many as I can over the next um, few minutes that we have left. Okay, so about the career does um, do certain posts and tours require language training and then what time frame um, are you typically on overseas deployment okay so that's a great thing about the foreign service uh, like i said we train you to do what to do your job yeah. um, we don't just send you out there and say good luck um so uh, 100 if a if a post requires language we have the Foreign Service Institute that uh, many of us go through uh, m multiple times um, to learn the language of the country we're going to. So in Mozambique, for example, that's Portuguese. So I went and tortured uh, the, the Portuguese instructors for six months. Um, after that, I got Costa Rica. So now I went and tortured the, the Spanish instructors for nine months uh, to get me up to speed. And they would actually agree with that statement. Um, the torture. So, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to go to Thailand, you're going to go sit through Thai. Um, it's just, we don't send you out without being prepared. Um, and that doesn't mean that we tell you everything, right? It, it doesn't. In, in DS, DSS and the department, you get a, a lot of opportunities really early on to take leadership roles and do meaningful work. Um, so you got to be ready to step up. That, but that doesn't mean that there's not support be, you know, underneath you and behind you to help you out, right? And that's a great thing about the department and DSS. That's great. And then the the part about um, what time frame are you typically on overseas deployment? You, well, you know, that really depends on the post, right? Uh, Costa Rica was three years, as you can imagine, it's pretty nice. Um, Mozambique was only two years. I, 
I love our, I love Mozambique. My kids love Mozambique. Um, and then, but Baghdad was only 12 months, right? It was only a year. I mean, that's a hardship post. So uh, we look at what are the conditions on the ground, and then that determines how long uh, a posting will be. Okay, great. So the next question is, um, what is your experience with fraudulently obtained legitimate documents? Because as this um, person writes, in his country or her country of Afghanistan, it is very common to have such documents. Yeah, no, and uh, we work those cases. Um, it, it, it is more difficult, but it's not impossible, all right? And and we are regularly, because when you're talking passport and visa fraud, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to go about it, but one of those ways is to obtain you know, fraudulently obtain real documents, right? And and then then you got to figure out what's you know what what part of it is fraud. It might be the documents might be fraud, the person might be fraud. It might be both. Um, it takes time, but we have ways to figure that out. We have staff that helps as well. Um, you know, so it's a whole process. But that is something that we you know it is a concern, and we know about it, and we work on that. I can't really get much more detailed than that. Okay. Um, was, I guess this is a follow-up question to, to that one, is uh, was there an inappropriate use of U.S. visas in, in the Costa Rica case? Um, not in this particular case, no, um, because they weren't, they weren't taking the kids out of the country, um, but they were having to move the children uh, it doesn't matter. They're sexually exploiting children. That's the definition of trafficking, right? That you hit that immediately when you're talking minors. So, um, you know, there, again, you have to look at the statutes of human trafficking, not just in the United States, but also internationally, and then um, and then in each country, because each country is different as well. So you, you, you're trying to then get to the elements of those crimes and prove those elements of the crime. Um, and so, but having said that, you know, there were other cases that um, Angie and, and Walter and Mauricio and I worked on regarding the use of fraudulent uh, visas. Um, and there's lots of different ways that that goes. Again, they might try to get a fraudulent, you know, obtain a U.S. visa fraudulently. They might counterfeit a, a visa. They might try to get another country's visa to make it look like they're a legitimate traveler. There's lots of different ways that we, you know, that that kind of stuff goes on. And I think this may be our last or second to uh -oh. last question. We just have a three minutes remaining. Um, okay. So this sounds like maybe it's someone who is a little bit in the know. Um, can you please speak a little bit about domestic assignments in field offices and the variety of work? Also, how do they differ at the entry level and at the mid level? All right. So the, the work that we do in the domestic field offices um, is, is vital to ensuring uh, the integrity of our passport and visa systems, um, you know, both in the, in the United States, but in, to also help out uh, around the world as well. And that's, you know, our, many of our field offices are located in cities where we have passport issuing uh, agencies, and we work uh, closely with our counterparts over in Consular Affairs um, to do that. And so, again, as I said, you know, when, when agents come on, their first assignment is domestic out in those field offices. And so they are, they are working those simple passport and visa fraud cases initially. Um, and I give all the credit in the world to, to, for my training that way, right? Um, but the other thing is, is we're also doing protection, right? The protection of, of foreign dignitaries coming over. Um, they will also do temporary assignments um, to SD, but they'll also sometimes get an opportunity to do temporary assignments overseas. Um, and so it's that training ground that uh, uh, permits, you know, that, that gives that agent that base. Now, kind of mid-level, that's when agents start when they've been overseas, um, they've been on for a little bit longer, they've done some other cases, or they just have other experience that's, that benefits us as well. They go back into the field offices to, to help, um, you know, help train and help be a part of uh, the new agents coming up, but also they're the ones that go in and, and start working those more complex cases, right? Because I can walk in and do a complex case. I don't have to do, a, I mean, I can do a simple passport fraud case. I love that too. Um, but I can now, I, I now have that experience to go in and do those, those cases. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have to repeat that last part. How do they? 
the question of how do these assignment domestic assignments um, differ at entry level versus mid level? It, it basically, when when you come back, you're going to either be um, in a more senior role or you'll be uh, a supervisor or assistant. Uh, you know, you're going to be at the higher levels, basically. Yeah. Okay. So this is definitely our last question. We're down to one minute. Um, uh, you talked about the big projects and the variety of projects that projects that DSS does, like busting child trafficking rings. Um, so, what is more typical for agents in DSS? Is this type of the the, tra the busting child trafficking rings more typical, or is it more facilitation and security, such as protecting diplomats? Is that more the norm? It's. You know, that's a great thing about DSS. You know, you, you do get that variety of experience, right? I'm, I, I do, you know, I'm, I've done protection. I've, I've done securing of embassies. I've done investigations. Um, I, I personally kind of track that way with investigations because that's what I like. But I know other colleagues really track in protection. I know others that really just the security of embassies. Um, and, and that's a great thing about DSS, right? You, you have this opportunity to really um experience a lot of different uh jobs different opportunities and then go back uh again a couple times to do what you enjoy um or, or what you just find more interesting um and so you know there isn't one career path in dss there just isn't there's there's multiple and and it's what you make of your assignments right if you if you don't take the opportunity to to put yourself out there and, and take those leadership roles, well, then, you know, you're, you're, you're probably not going to have that great of a career. But the more you get yourself out there and, and step up, you really can help guide your own, own career. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. We're up at our hour mark. Kayla, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us through um, basically everything <laughs> uh, that DSS does and your career and the case in particular. We really appreciate it. I hope everyone who's attended today was able to um, be satisfied with the information that we got today. I think, as I said, this, this series is really intended to introduce um, folks to all the different types of work that the Foreign Service does. And I hope that this was as interesting to all of you uh, online today as it was to me. So a few things um, before we get off today, Kayla mentioned that she wrote an article for the Foreign Service Journal. We dropped the link in the chat box. Take a look. Um, and it gives you more information, especially things that we weren't able to cover. Um, if you are interested in has, attending future events that APSA is putting together, like Diplomats at Work, um, please do sign up. Let us know. Uh, sign up by emailing events at afsa.org and we'll put you on our mailing list. And then finally, if you are interested in the, a career with DSS, you can go to careers.state.gov backslash DS and you can find more information on how uh, to join Diplomatic Security Service. And then finally, finally, if you haven't had a chance to do the survey, again, takes just a few seconds, please do so, it'll help us greatly. Um, and finally, that's it. We'll be sending this recording out with um, to all folks who registered via email, and we'll also send out links to those uh, articles that appeared in Costa Rican press that Kayla had mentioned as well, and any other information that we think you might find helpful. So again, we hope you enjoyed it today, as certainly as much as I did. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Kayla. Thank you, Nadja.